I'm wearing snake print, and we all know what that means. After a devastating public backlash, which was mostly triggered by the dishonic antics of the now defunct Kimye, but also partly a natural effect of a years long overexposure and not a small amount of arrogance on Taylor Swift's part, Reputation was essentially the turning point in Taylor Swift's personal life and her professional life too, and especially in the public persona of one of our generation's biggest pop stars. Taylor was contending with a number of existential challenges at this moment in time. The question that she really needed to ask herself was what kind of pop star do I want to be and what kind of pop star am I capable of being after such an intense and ferocious intrusion on my private life is it possible to protect my energy and have a private life while pursuing the level of success that I have chased doggedly and that has been so important to me since the literal iteration of my career this existential challenge wasn't the only hurdle that Taylor Swift was meeting and facing at this point into her career she was well into the later stages of being a pop star for just going by the traditional conventional norms and streaming, music trends changing, new players in the pop game. The old model of what being a pop star was, how it looked, how you were supposed to conduct yourself and behave, how you were supposed to gradually bow out and fade into irrelevance when your time had come, especially as a young woman. That was something she was contending with as well. And also, you know, really trying to match or surpass the success of what happened with 1989. There was no way that you can, you know, make lightning strike twice. There was never going to be 1989 the sequel it always had to be something different and that something different was always going to be polarizing especially in the moment that Taylor Swift was making reputation in the line from look what you made me do the old Taylor can't come to the phone right now why because she's dead was ruthlessly mocked and not taken seriously and when lover came out eventually we the fans turned around and said whoo okay thank god the old Taylor is not dead she is still alive and kicking but you know what I'd argue that there is a version of Taylor that will never come back from that there is an old version of Taylor that will never come to the phone again. A certain iteration of Taylor Swift was destroyed in the backlash that came with Snakegate and beyond. In this video essay, I am going to explore the enduring impact of Reputation, an album that I was worried about aging poorly when I first heard it, and has actually ended up aging like wine. It certainly had a retrospective renaissance, and I'm super excited to be talking about it with you today. This is going to be a little bit different from my Speak Now album breakdown video that I did. I'm not going to go in depth track by track with the album. Instead, I'm going to be talking about the music in general, kind of the moment that this album met and the response that it garnered. This is going to be more similar to my Lana Del Rey video essays. So if you like this video, my name is Zach. I'm the Swiftologist. I make thoughtful weekly videos about pop culture on this channel. You should subscribe if you're interested. We just hit 20,000 subscribers. I'm so excited about that. I can't wait to create more for you. If there is an album, an era, or something of any artist that you want me to cover in this format and this style, leave me a comment down below and let me know. And if you are interested in having more thoughtful, unfiltered, constructive conversations about pop culture. You definitely want to check out my podcast, The Evolution of a Snake, and also check out our Patreon, patreon.com slash Swiftologist. That is where all the cool stuff on the internet is happening. But today we are talking about maybe one of my favorite eras of Taylor Swift, just because of how iconic it was. And we're going to go through a couple of different segments and parts to this video. And I will lead you through starting with part one, which is called Gone Girl. In November of 2016, Taylor Swift began a period of reclusion that now seems obvious and common place given you know how little we heard from her during the pandemic and in the gaps between you know folklore evermore and midnights but this was very jarring for the fans and the public after the much covered and discussed 1989 era where taylor swift was completely overexposed and everywhere all at once taylor's reputation at this point was in tatters snake gate as i mentioned was not the only contributing factor to the public's fatigue with taylor swift she was simply everywhere as i mentioned she was too loud for too long and as the wider forces in the culture mainly politics headed in an increasingly post polarized direction, the calls for Taylor to practice what she preached, that girl boss feminism, you know, the chickens do come home to roost. This amounted to a decision that she made, which was to basically drop off the face of the earth in the wake of all this contention and backlash that was facing her. We didn't really know where she was during this period of time. She performed a couple of contractually obligated shows that she had signed up for before obviously all of this had happened. But the first half of 2016 was a truly dizzying whirlwind of her breaking up with Calvin Harris, winning album of the year, a for 1989, Snakegate, and the Hiddle Swift nonsense roller coaster ride all at once. And this experience of being burned so publicly definitely influenced her decision to GTFO and move to London with her new flame, Joe Alwyn. Although that was certainly a delicate situation uh, that is now over if you're keeping pace with what's going on in the world of Taylor Swift at the moment. She wanted to protect this growing and budding love that was really kind of bringing.
bringing her back from the brink and the edge of falling apart and for as long as possible while it was still growing and while it was still in a delicate stage. But during this time, she was writing and the record she was writing was not the vengeful takedown that was eventually marketed. We all know now that Reputation is a covert love story, a tale of redemption and reincarnation, of sacrifice, loss, envy, regret and despair. It was kind of a lot all together, all at once. At this point, I think she was really contemplating whether she even could come back at all. And I really believe that she did toy with this idea briefly while she was in her protective love bubble with Joe, licking her wounds and deciding whether or not she was brave enough to come back and really fight back against these accusations. And she truly had, at this point, before she met Joe and went into this kind of small, protected, isolated bubble, got lost in the sauce. In this very brief period of downtime that we had between the cancellation and the reputation era kind of kicking up again, Taylor definitely got some perspective and realized that if she did want to come back, it wouldn't be possible to do it without directly addressing the kerfuffle that she had endured. Now, keep in mind that this was not the kind of model that Taylor had been working on at the moment. We know her now to clap back and to uh, make assertions and to address things head on, especially in song. But at this point in time, the closest that we had ever come to her kind of addressing any sort of public backlash about herself in song was with Blank Space. And Blank Space really did provide kind of a blueprint for the satirical songwriting that was explored more in depth on reputation, but she leaned into it much more heavily and with a seriousness and a gravitas that was very badass in hindsight. She created this whole character that allowed her to re-enter the public eye while still protecting her real self, this fragile and frangible self that was still definitely under repair. At the bottom of an exile, Taylor found true and real love, but she also found a renewed willingness to be a pop star again. The renegotiated Taylor Swift was starting to take place in hibernation. There were rumors swirling that she was being carried in and out of events and luggage and stage equipment. Who can know the truth? I mean, probably true given what we've seen from the Eras tour, but she mostly stayed in London around this time and she was occasionally spotted out and about, but she knew intuitively during this time of absence that she couldn't just come back with the America's sweetheart shtick once again, because part of the problem that she was having reputationally was that she was no longer a relatable figure and she couldn't really hide under the guise of being your best friend forever and ever anymore. Her life had become so blown out of proportion that it was difficult to really go back to the basics of her songwriting, which was making relatable content for young girls. At this moment in time, Taylor was seen by large swaths of people, not just haters, uh, the general public, I would say, as the whole, saw her as this conniving and calculating operator. And there definitely is truth to that. There are calculating and operative parts to her personality. But in her efforts to seem as relatable as possible, she definitely, you know, manufactured an aw shucks persona that portrayed her as unassuming or as the underdog. And the idea of Taylor Swift being an underdog was well and truly not bought by the general public in 2017. One thing that Taylor has always known how to do, however, is pivot. And she is very good at responding to criticism because she is massively self-aware. I think the position she ended up occupying with reputation were a career and legacy saving life force. She was able to capitalize off of the drama and the kind of negative gossip surrounding her while personally extricating her real fragile self that she was hiding and nursing from the narrative by playing this character and obfuscating the true love story behind the album, kind of reserving it a little bit only for people who cared enough to listen. Essentially what she was saying with the whole marketing of this album was, you won't talk about me. You'll talk about the character that I've created for you, but I shan't speak on this matter. I will let you run in circles because you're gonna do it anyway, with or without my participation. It was honestly a mind game. Part three, the resurrection. How exactly Taylor went about delivering this album to the public is honestly a masterclass in marketing. As I mentioned, her self-awareness and her nose for getting the temperature of the room is truly unmatched. So her strategy when marketing this album was to let the concept of a reputation, which is a widespread belief that someone or something has a particular characteristic, precede her usual tactics of talking the album to death. The real challenge here was for her to be able to create momentum for this album that she was not going to speak on and remain ever present in the public consciousness without being actually visible, really using her aura and her mystique and the kind of legend surrounding her at that moment to build hype. And if you look at any of the rollouts of her prior records, they were incredibly involved productions. We're talking months long promotional executions with various external stakeholders and multiple moving parts. And largely when it comes to pop music, the success of a record or an album cycle really depends on the media as well. Not so much in the era of social media, which was definitely starting to take more precedence in reputation. We could, we could look to reputation as one of the first big high budget pop efforts that benefited from a truly social rollout. But it was during this time that Taylor 
Taylor had really developed a deeper mistrust of the media and of journalists or of allowing other people to interpret her intentions and twist her words around. She had had quite enough of that by the time that Reputation was ready to hit the shelves. She was understandably traumatized by what happened with Kanye West, and it was a sharp and painful lesson that no matter how beloved you are as a celebrity, you are never too big to fail. Part of the reason why the media loved her before the cancellation was because of how game she was to engage them. What they didn't like, however, during the 1989 era, was a certain arrogance that Taylor had developed towards them. It was kind of a quid pro quo. I'll give you access if you give me good coverage. And that can be true to a certain extent, but I think that we know the Taylor Swift empire got a little bit too big for its britches here. Not just Taylor herself, her publicist, her representatives started acting very punitively towards journalists, which again, I don't think really endeared her to them much more. Her publicity team became very increasingly discontent with factual inaccuracies, but even more deeply, they wanted to have these total controls over what was being said, truth be damned, as well. And we can see this really in the slow freeze of a journalist like Eve Barlow, who, uh, you know, has her own issues and has gone on her own journey since she was blacklisted from the music industry by Taylor Swift. But essentially, she was invited into Taylor's inner fold uh, when she wrote something nice about Taylor. And then when she gave kind of a lukewarm review of the 1989 opening night, she was slowly blackballed from many music events and extricated from Taylor's inner circle. You know, there are punishments, there are retributions if you don't play the game that Taylor Swift wants you to play. And this is also part of the reason why why she wasn't playing with the media because she felt as though she couldn't trust them to play on the terms that were acceptable to her anymore. And it's important to remember that this directive is top down. Taylor is unusually in control of all aspects of her career. Instead of a manager, she has a team, a management team handled by herself, her close family members and her publicist that controls her entire career. So any decision that's made in Taylor's professional life was likely made with a heavy involvement from her. Nothing goes off her desk without her stamp of approval. So the first component of the resurrection was erasure. And now this was a really big deal a huge deal in 2017. It's hard to conceptualize now, but Taylor really spearheaded the tabula rasa approach, the burning it down and starting it over. She wiped her social media and dropped three videos over a couple of days, which amounted to a hissing snake in the square format on her profile with the comments turned off. Interestingly, Instagram actually introduced the turning off comments or filtering comments as a feature in the wake of Snakegate. And that really speaks to the level of blowback and uh, backlash she was receiving at that time in July 2016 is when they allowed users to start limiting their comment sections because uh, this is where the, the Taylor hate was really picking up steam. Kim Kardashian was celebrating National Snake Day and encouraging people to flood Taylor Swift's Instagram with the snake. So these videos drop of a snake hissing and were gagged. It was such a jaw-dropping moment to see that first video with the tail of the snake and immediately before we'd heard anything from the record or even seen her in public again we knew two very important things about this new Taylor first that she was directly confronting her public image and not pretending that nothing had happened and trying to just continue as usual as America's sweetheart and two that an older model of her was being retired so eventually this teasing and hyping led to a three tile Instagram post with the album cover a moody stare directly looking into the camera chin cocked slightly provoking the listener with an embattled nonchalance and the name of the album, Reputation, letting us know that the single was to follow the day after. And the contrast of the black and white imagery and with the vibrancy, larger than life, dreamy and whimsical 1989 couldn't have been a starker contrast. It was her most dramatic and seemingly untailor like reinvention yet. Part four, the old Taylor. Look what you made me do instantly breaks streaming records when it's released. In hindsight, and I'm going to quote from a New York Times album review of Lover, there have been two major jolts to Swift's musical grammar over her 13-year career. On Red, when she first attempted Pumped Up Pop and completely rebuilt the foundation of her sound, and on Reputation, which will likely stand as the outer boundary of the risks that she'll take. As performers get older and more successful, their willingness to pivot typically softens as well. So the sonic palette of Reputation is probably the most daring and adventurous Taylor's pop music is ever going to get. It was brash. It was noisy, it was confrontational, it was less melody focused, and it was more reliant on studio effects to really enhance this jarring, moody, all-encompassing world of bad guys, bright lights, big love, and psychic damage. And we see all of this most evidently in the record-breaking Look What You Made Me Do. It is a polarizing song. Whether you love it or hate it, there is no in-between. It's not mindlessly palatable, like we are never ever getting back together or shake it off. In fact, if anything, it kind of deliberately turns off the reader, or at least tests their patience. I think that there are two ways that people can 
consume art in this world. So people either consume art to be entertained or they consume art to be challenged. Of course, there can be a combination of the two. But I would say in general, Taylor Swift's career has more been about entertaining her audience. Reputation, I think, may just be the closest we ever get to her challenging us and pushing the limits and testing how far we'll follow her into a rabbit hole. Look What You Made Me Do is a crazy song. <laughs> From start to finish, with the manic strings and the thumping bass line and the right said Fred, I'm too sexy for my shirt sample, it doesn't really have a chorus. The lyrics are kind of abstract and they don't really make sense if you're not familiar on the ins and outs of Taylor's social media nonsense. The production wallops in and it wallops out. The bridge is basically just one lyric. Think about it. She could have led with something like I did something bad for a similar theme, but a more conventional hit melody or ready for it even. It was similarly jarring, but had a more bulletproof pop chorus. Delicate was the obvious choice for a lead single, and it would have given her a much more sympathetic re-entry into the public view. Getaway Car picks up right exactly from where we left off. So why look what you made me do? Well, even Jack Antonoff was kind of surprised that Taylor let him do what he did with the production on this track. He said that he was sure she would cut that gothic string lead in that he contributed, that iconic beginning part of Look What You Made Me Do. And he was certain, so certain that it was off the wall that she would cut it out, but she kept it in. She let it stay and she wanted to weird people out. She wanted to make a splash. It's extremely untaylor like to pick the most unpopular or out there song to introduce an album cycle. But again, this was allegedly a blank slate, fresh start where we are meeting essentially a new artist. And all of this was told to us by the much memed and now very camp and iconic, the old Taylor can't come to the phone right now. Why? Because she's dead. So I return to that question. Is the old Taylor really dead? I maintain that there was something of her that was lost in the process of going through what she went through with this record, making it and putting it out. And that's part of what makes Reputation such a challenging album. Partly when you first listen to it, if you have no context and you're really used to a very old model of Taylor, you are wondering, where is she? Can she come to the phone for like a second? Part five, the visuals. Admittedly, I think the rollout of this album campaign could have been done better with better single choices. You can watch my Reputation tier ranking and reorganizing the track list to get a better sense of how I would tell this story chronologically. But overall, I would say this is one of her most visually cohesive records. Taylor's track record with her visual discography is not so great. And with all the videos being produced by Joseph Kahn, we get this really moody, gothic, almost neo-horror vibe throughout all of the visuals for this record. It was a cinematic album, that's for sure, lyrically and thematically. There was definitely a missed opportunity for visuals. I will do another video on that in the future, how I think that that could have played out and panned out differently. Taylor tapped noted fashion photographers Mert and Marcus with whom she'd previously worked on the iconic Bleach Blonde Vogue cover shoot, the beginning of Bleachella. So perfect of her to reunite with these chaotic kings to recreate some more chaotic energy, to photograph and help her produce the album cover. And it's a black and white image. The head is tilted up kind of aggressively. The font is very gothic and it has this kind of retro newspapery vibe. It definitely reflects the overall conceit of gossip, rumors, and notoriety. Black and white is a big step for Taylor. I know it doesn't seem like it, but she's known for being, you know, a happy-go-lucky in love girl with these dreamy, optimistic, or very kind of stereotypical rote sad girl songs. And this was the first official visual that we received from the record. Record. But like the lead single, the album cover was received pretty poorly by the media. Billboard named it one of the worst albums of all time. Um, hello? wrong. Everything about this album, though, was totally polarizing. Let's talk about the music video visuals. Whew, there's so much to unpack here, and I won't dive into specific Easter eggs, but the visuals from Reputation play such an important part of the role of creating the album's legacy because of the there will be no explanation, there will just be Reputation conceit that she had developed, you know, saying that she wasn't going to speak on this record at all, she was going to let it speak for itself. So the visuals really had to do the talking. And this era is more unique than anything she's ever done before because she's not a explaining to us what the album is going to be like. It's just a reputation. She doesn't want to let us know how we should interpret it. It's really up to us to decide how and when we want to engage. The Look What You Made Me Do video was a blow to the head. It was highly anticipated and it premiered at the VMAs. And to me, this is one of the last moments of pop culture's true hegemonic moments where everybody was tuned into the same frequency and paying attention and talking about the same thing. It was very clearly the product of a meticulous assessment by Taylor of what the specific misinformation she wanted to make fun of, address or clarify, and, you know, kind of 
poke at the absurdity of in her first big public appearance since the cancellation. And it was also notable tonally because of her breaking the fourth wall with blank space, etc. And this was also, I think, the era of tea in 2017. The shade room was really taking off. There was a lot of like gossip and fake news that was really kind of coming to the forefront. It was a kind of maliciousness, <laughs> like public gossip that uh, cancel culture, pylons, that was really all kind of uh, synthesizing very clearly in one place for the first time. And the first frame of this video is instantly iconic. We have Neil Soberg, the pseudonym that she wrote, uh, this is what you came for under with Calvin Harris. That was his string of tweets was one of the first uh, dominoes that flicked the cancellation attempt. And we have Here Lies Taylor Swift's Reputation. The Met Gala cell from 2014 is being married in a grave. And I think this is very symbolic um, because this is the moment right before she left country music forever and was transitioning away from being America's sweetheart into the domineering girl boss that led to the overexposure. She's being buried. The true epitome of the old Taylor is that big sweetheart dress that she wore. Uh, we pivot to basically the IG badification of Taylor Swift, the image of her as this money hungry capitalist queen surrounded by diamonds with that symbolic $1 for the sexual assault case next to her in this glossy red lip. It's very scarlet letter and we pretty much instantly meet the snake motif in all of its glory and it's shocking. It's She's really, truly reclaiming this symbol. So actually thank you Kim Kardashian for giving Taylor another brilliant motif and image to add into her visual discography. She's sitting on her throne, there's an inscription of et tu brute, symbolizing how all her fake friends had come to betray her in her time of need. And there are so many metaphors throughout this video, her eating lobster in this opulent gold cage while watching chaos go on around her, crashing this gold plated car with a grand in her hand, sawing off the wing of her own plane and referencing the subconscious self-sabotage of her own career. There's layers to this shit. It's very hard to stress the gag for this if you weren't there for when it premiered, but it was truly a moment watching the Taylor Mountain appear. Uh, and these days, once an era was done for a pop star, I guess it was really kind of like over. So to have her dressed up as her old selves was at first so comforting. I remember seeing it and being like, oh my God, I can't believe she's acknowledging the Red Tour and the Fearless Tour. Then it was unbelievably jarring as she like kicked them in the face and killed them off. And she really selected her most beloved uh, iconic Taylor personas as well. I'm really thinking of Fearless and Red Taylor here. And then we have the delivery of that line about the old Taylor. I mean, <laughs> Look What You Made Me Do is one of those songs that you can't really separate from its visual. The two are inseparable. And I think that's, you know, the hallmark of a great pop moment when you instantly recall something. And the end of this video, the dialogue of all the old Taylors in conversation with themselves is the ultimate Easter egg. She is drawing a connection to the public between all the various ways in which her personality traits have been weaponized against her, fair or unfair, from something as banal as her surprised face to her extreme reaction at being called a bitch. Shut up, that visual scream at the end. She's like, I get it. I'm sick of me too. But you're gonna have to play with somebody else because this new bitch is locked and loaded and she's taking no prisoners. There's so much more to unpack here from the dancers wearing the I Heart TS shirts to her controlling a room of mannequins in a latex bodysuit and robbing a streaming company's bank. But what I want to say is really that this was the start of the Taylor Swift multiverse, a place where I now live and it is crazy in here. It's hard to keep track of everything that's going on. There's things flying past my head every single second, but you know, I'm. I'm taking notes. It was really genius, so innovative, so creative, so inventive, and the bar was so high that the rest of the visuals from this era were inevitably going to fall a little bit flat, but the execution of the overall vibe, I would say, is very consistent. No other Taylor Swift era can say the same in terms of consistency. And the end game video is truly a nothing burger, but that coat, is a look. I guess it kind of symbolizes the fun and hidden life she was having in London while everyone thought that she was gone forever. The ready for it video is truly um, James. What was that? Delicate is interesting, I suppose, as a concept. Some people really seem to love it, but I think it was so far into the album campaign that it did fall a bit flat. I probably would have just shoved this up to a second single, put Ready For It third, and did Getaway Car scrapped Endgame. The jig was kind of up already, but I think the idea of her wanting to be invisible and feeling free away from prying eyes is super interesting and definitely is a thesis for the record in general. Now let's do part five, the record. Let's talk about the music. The way she described reputation at the secret session, yes, I went to a secret session, me mentioning it in every video that 
that I possibly can. She described it as 80% a love story and 20% vindictive. And there are certainly character and persona driven songs on this record, which I think is what threw people off. She tapped Jack Antonoff to work much more extensively with her on this record. And prior to being heavily involved with Reputation, Jack had not really been given the green light to work on a huge pop girls moment like that. And as we know, he's the go-to guy now. Everybody wants a piece of Jack, but Taylor really trusted him. From the small collaborations that they did together on 1989, she knew that he was the right person to kind of deal with the more emotional, vulnerable, and intimate components of this album. And the production work is basically divided between him and Max Martin and Johan Schellback, the tried and true Swedish pop god dream team from Red through 1989. A lot of your most favorite songs were produced by Max Martin and Johan Schellback, Shake It Off, Blank Space, We Are Never Ever Getting Back Together, 22, I Knew Your Trouble, You Get the Drift. You can definitely feel a difference in the production between Jack Antonoff and Max Martin's work on this record, but overall, I think it works together very cohesively, thanks to Taylor's often uncredited role as an executive producer. I think this might be a sticking point with Max Martin and Taylor and why she's kind of hesitant to work with him again in the future. I don't think he lets artists take production credit and he also insists on taking a writing credit, whether or not he actually contributed from a writing point of view. So the vindictive and character driven songs, basically the ones that were made to be more public facing and to do the bait and switching of this whole album, made for radio hits essentially were entrusted to the Max Martin hit making production machine. He gets more songs, but I do think that Jack Antonoff's work on this record is probably a little bit more impactful from an emotional resonating point of view. I really like them working together though, because the contributions that they both made on 1989 and Reputation formed two immaculate, perfect pop albums in my perspective. So the Max Martin songs on Reputation are Ready For It, Endgame, I Did Something Bad, Don't Blame Me, Delicate, So It Goes, Gorgeous, King of My Heart, and Dancing With Our Hands Tied. The Jack Antonoff songs are Dress, Getaway Car, Look What You Made Me do this is why we can't have nice things call it what you want and new year's day as you can tell the max martin songs are definitely more straightforward wrote pop songs and the jack antonoff songs are definitely a little bit quirkier they're a little bit left of center still pop but there's a kind of quirky vibe to it sonically and thematically reputation was really the furthest departure that we've had from the taylor swift brand if we're looking at debut as the blueprint for example what she was known for and came into the public eye with is this country confessional songwriting and she really didn't shed that reputation until Reputation. The more opaque, abstract, and unrelatable messaging on Reputation was very jarring when we are comparing it to what we expected from her before. Though it's certainly more of a make of it what you will, it's not as directly relatable or confessional as an album like Speak Now or Red, but it's also not as easily made for radio or easy listening as 1989. It's truly something unique. And something Taylor has always been really good at is understanding where and how she can chameleon her core skills into being relevant for whatever trends are developing in the wider world of pop music beyond just her scene and she does this really smartly by not veering too far into the trendy territory and sticking to the songwriting to bolster her work and help her float through stylistic experimentation so what was popular in 2017 let's take let's zoom out and take a look and see what taylor had to try and conform to it was maybe one of our most diverse years in pop music from a genre perspective trap and hip-hop tropical house the last breaths of edm and a heavy r&b influence too streaming really reshaped and redefined what it meant to be a pop artist. It wasn't just one thing anymore. It was a darker, less optimistic time for pop and the world in general. And pop music, the lyrics, etc. It was definitely more nihilistic. It was definitely a little bit more capitalistic too. It was all about getting the bag and fuck you for getting in my way. So how does Taylor keep up here? None of this is very like resonant with the old confessional country songwriting Taylor, right? So she keeps up by incorporating elements, very small little bits and pieces of all those genre experiments that I mentioned to you throughout this record. We can see the Tropical House influence on the album Highlight Delicate, and we can also see the trap hip-hop and EDM influences on Ready For It, Endgame, and I Did Something Bad. She was walking a very fine tightrope sonically here, and she did it excellently. She was not focused on melodic songwriting, which is really her strength. Instead, she was focusing more on her delivery and her performance of this character and persona. So whether that's the rapping on Ready For It or Endgame, or the kind of mumblecore talk singing-esque of gorgeous, delicate, and call it what you want. Another Another jarring omission from this record that was very untaylor like was the lack of live instruments. There are, I think, no live guitars on this record at all. The producers really relied heavily on synths, drum machines, electronic beats, strings, vocal processing effects, and sampling. And this gave Reputation an extremely maximalist, bombastic, lavish, 
and gothic, but very strategically and expensively DIY filter and vibe. The album sounded the way that the narrator felt, combative, but newly emboldened to try something different. The book ends of this record are, though a little bit forced, very poignant. We end with New Year's Day, private isolated love bubble, and we begin with ready for it, pop star mode engaged and activated. And New Year's Day really is kind of the only moment on this record where we get to meet the old Taylor in some sort of iteration. It was very interesting that critics picked up on New Year's Day as a highlight. I always felt that it was a little bit forced, kind of like how I feel about daylight, if you know how I feel about that, but you know, to each their own. Part six, the reception. Despite Taylor's subdued promotional efforts. No interviews, just a handful of performances on SNL. She did Ready For It and Call It What You Want, looking very nervous, and also doing the secret sessions. The album was still a commercial juggernaut. It really proves to me that, like, at this point, her only competition is herself. She did 1.2 million copies of Reputation in the first week. It's kind of middling overall in the sales figures, I think, in total of all her albums, but it certainly wasn't a flop or a failure by any stretch of the imagination. The enduring hits, however, didn't really endure. I think the reputation era, the idea of it as something that has compellingly really slipped into, you know, popular culture. We all the time talk about, you know, going into a really bad period of our lives where we're still slaying and living as our reputation eras. That's an interesting artifact and definitely a huge impact that the album had on the culture at large. However, when we think about standout songs, I guess Don't Blame Me has had a retroactive activation on TikTok, but I think Delicate is probably the only song that had a really decent shelf life in terms of being on the charts for a really long time and getting a lot of radio play. Look What You Made Me Do is iconic. I think everybody will remember that, but I wouldn't say that a lot of people like it. I will say in general, though, the general public, uh, from being there and talking to my friends that, you know, we're definitely more casual Taylor listeners, the general public was not really down with this when it came out, the entire album. But thankfully, the Taylor Nation is a large and diverse place. So it didn't really matter if the casual fans weren't engaging because the hardcore fans were uh, trauma bonded to her in a way that we had never been before. And if anything, this really just strengthened the intensity of the fan connection to her now. Now we really had an underdog to root for because everyone hated her. And I mean, anything that she put out at this juncture because her public reputation was so fraught would have been polarizing or not met very well by critics who were really just waiting for her to fail. And I think that's why this record was so out there in terms of her pop music. And the mixed response that it received was kind of funny. It got a 6.5 from Pitchfork, actually, but they did describe dress as a panting, shuddering highlight, and I have literally never forgotten that, so we have that to thank for them. It is kind of crazy that they rated Lover higher than Reputation, and I think that just goes to show you how important timing is to a record and how, you know, the reputation of a pop star or of a celebrity can impact the way that we view their work, because a lot of critics have reassessed their initial responses to reputation in hindsight it is very fondly looked upon as an underrated Taylor Swift album I think and I think that Carrie Baton from the New Yorker really got it spot on in her review she said in the future when people tell the story of pop's dying days as a monolithic entity they might point to reputation as one of its final chapters she notes how little filler there is on the album and how skillfully executed it is and how Taylor is so devoted to performance on the album I also loved this excerpt from the very celebrated critic of from the New York Times John Carrie Minka on pop music's uh, take on reputation. He said, there's a shift away from her signature melodies to an approach that uses her voice as an accent piece or seasoning. The difference between songs that are 24K Taylor and ones that are merely Taylor plated. It means a continued de-emphasis, one that began on her last album, 1989, of the sorts of dense narratives that were so integral to her early career. It means that on a few th songs here, Taylor Swift is doing something at least a little bit like rapping. Make no mistake, these are jarring propositions and yet Miss Swift commits to them and thrives, an act of liberation from her past, and also a calculation about what the marketplace can bear. Even Pitchfork, you know, after giving a 6.5 had to concede, they said, reputation isn't the failure that seemed possible a month or two ago. Yeah, it's important to point out as well that critics were really kind of projecting that Taylor was going to flop and that this was really going to be the be all end all of her career. They go on to say that it's full of bulletproof hooks and sticky turns of phrase, but in committing to a more conventional form of superstardom, Swift has de-emphasized the skill at the core of her genius. Then they go on to talk about how New Year's Day is the best song on the record and the other songs just aren't as good. I don't know if I necessarily agree with that. I think she was taking a hiatus from the kind of confessional songwriting that she has certainly returned to post-reputation, but I can see, you know, if you have no context, whatever. Um, but critics were obsessed with the idea of her 
flopping. And it was as though because her personal life had collapsed, her professional one must too. And they were wrong. When Taylor announced the Reputation Stadium tour, there were think pieces every other day about how she had absolutely no chance of selling it out and that the tour would be a commercial disaster, blah, blah, blah. But they don't know the Taylor Nation. They haven't read the sacred text. With 53 shows all over the world, the Reputation Stadium tour is one of the highest grossing tour in history, and it's made around $350 million. And I think that that just goes to show that it takes a little bit more than a Kim Kardashian and a snake emoji to cancel the musically proficient Cobra that we have come to know and love. And I think that Reputation's legacy really is that it is the most experimental out there, darkest that we're ever going to see Taylor, the most kind of committed to performance and to character-driven persona. I am always intrigued by the storytelling on that record. And the more that I revisit it, the more I realize how well thought out it is and also how it is pretty much front to back bangers. There's very little filler on this record. And the same can't be said for a bloated uh, follow up like a lover. And even I think Midnight's is a little bit inconsistent. To me, Reputation is her last truly great, great, great pop record. And I'm very curious and excited to see if we'd ever get something kind of even in a similar vein to it. I think that's probably not possible given the very unique conditions that had to take place for this to come about in the first instance. But I think that this idea of resurrection and Taylor rising up from the dead, she does it all the time, is a true testament to the power of the parasocial relationship that she has built with her fans. Like truly, we will ride with her through anything. All she has to do is give us a good story, give us a little bit of intrigue, promise us a little bit of gossip and drama, and show us that along the way, we're going to have a good time. We're going to dance, we're going to sing, we're going to relate. And even though Reputation was her most unrelatable record, I think that it was a real reckoning moment for the fandom and that we really got to get an inside look at what it was like to be famous. Because we'd heard from her kind of about what what it was like to be a young girl that was in love and what it was like to grow up and lose your innocence. We had heard a lot of those themes before, but we hadn't really had her directly addressing what it was like to be famous. And this was the first, I'd say, beginning iteration of the Taylor Swift multiverse. And I personally loved to see it. All right, well, that is all that I have for you in this video. Let me know how you feel about Reputation. What are the enduring highlights for you? My favorite songs from Reputation are Dress, Always and Forever. It's one of my favorite Taylor Swift songs, period. I love Getaway Car. And So It Goes currently is heavy on my rotation, as is Ready For it. I mean, the reputation part of the Eras tour is truly, truly one of the best. So let me know what album you want me to do next from Taylor or any other records or eras that you would like me to explore in this manner. These videos do take me a little bit longer to produce because of the research required and the editing involved, but I hope that you liked it. Do you guys like the fit? I'm being a snake today. I'm being a professional snake. Snake with a jacket on, okay? Thank you again so much for 20,000 subscribers. I can't wait to see where this channel goes in the next year and come to the Patreon. I'll see you there and I'll see you in the next video. Goodbye, Swifties. Oh!